Good day, everyone. Uh, I am at a different time zone, so it's very late where I am, so it's good night for me. Uh, we have today the privilege of uh, hosting for a seminar uh, Mr. Jim Herberg, from the, uh, <coughs> who is the general manager of the Orange County Sanitation District. Uh, a very famous uh, sanitation district or very famous district uh, in Southern California, uh, being known for its uh, uh, facilities that uh, deal with or treat wastewater uh, for a population of 2.6 million people. Uh, as part of their uh, preparedness for climate change, which is uh, putting the facilities at high risk uh, due to possible flooding, sea level rise, uh, wildfire, and extreme heat risks, uh, which again can create uh, damages in the range of millions and maybe even more dollars to the infrastructure. But the point is even more severe because in addition to the direct damages or risk for damages, the service to the 2.6 million people can be interrupted and who knows? I mean, I don't know if this is part of what uh, Jim is going to tell us about, but who knows what will be the consequences and how to prepare for it. So this is a very fascinating uh, topic that uh, more and more water districts face and uh, acknowledge and prepare. And we are going to learn today about a specific experience that hopefully what we are going to take with us at the end of the seminar is how to deal and how to prepare plans for addressing climate change effects on those type of uh, weather risks. So let me say also a couple of words about our speaker. So, uh, First of all, I would say that Jim uh, uh, has been with the Orange County Sanitation District since 1995. And uh, he has more than 30 years of professional experience. And he is now the general manager of Orange County, County Sanitation District. And he served in that capacity since 2013. So he has a lot of experience and he grew through the ranks, as we say, uh, and knows all the sides of how to deal with the uh, issues and problems and solve them. Uh, and we are going to benefit from his presentation today. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ariel, for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, thank you to UCR for, for having me uh, today and, and good afternoon to everyone uh, joining us. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention and your interest uh, in this uh, important topic. Uh, what I'll do today is I will talk about uh, the Orange County Sanitation District's approach um, to uh, developing a climate resiliency study pro and a program uh, to implement solutions. And some of these solutions are very practical uh, and, and very um, um, common sense uh, adaptations, uh, but it's all based on a very impressive study and, and looking at multiple um, hazards at, at the same time. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my slideshow. Which I, uh, which I hope I am doing right now. I hope everyone can see it. Are we, are we uh, online? Can everyone see that? All right, thank you. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we are the uh, Orange County Sanitation District. We serve 2.6 million people. 
uh, in central and northern Orange, Orange County. Every day we collect and treat 185 million gallons a day uh, of wastewater. If you look at the, the infrastructure shown on this map, right, the, the dark green lines represent the main collection system sewers that the sanitation district owns. Again, we're the regional wastewater agency. We collect the wastewater from the 20 plus cities in, in central and northern Orange County, those 2.6 million people, and bring it to our regional wastewater treatment plants. We have the two large treatment plants, about 400 miles of large sewer lines and 15 outlying pump stations for the, the low lying areas to pump the wastewater into the treatment plants. Um, of that 185 million gallons a day that we treat, 130 million gallons every day of our treated effluent is sent to the Orange County Water District, our partner and our neighbor. They produce 100 million gallons a day of advanced purified drinking quality water that is reintroduced into the groundwater basin uh, every day. The largest indirect potable reuse project of its kind in the world. Uh, so a very important operation. We don't just treat water and, and put it out in the ocean. We are a water resource recovery agency uh, producing uh, clean water for recycling, as I mentioned. Um, the uh, digester gas that we generate in our anaerobic digesters is used to generate electricity on site. Two thirds of the power that it takes to treat the wastewater here in, in Orange County um, is provided by our own uh, biofuel that we generate in our digesters. And all of the biosolids uh, that we generate as well um, is uh, reused as a soil amendment or is, is composted. So, and we're very proud of that. And that's our mission is, is, is a water resource recovery facility. So the, the facilities that we have, the two treatment plants, the pump stations and the collection system, all of that together um, would have a replacement value. Ariel mentioned the amount of damage that could be done uh, by, by climate change. Or, or you know, flooding and things. Uh, Eleven billion dollar replacement value of that infrastructure right now today, uh, in today's dollars. So, uh, quite a bit of infrastructure that we have to take care of, and so it's certainly worth investing in uh, to make sure that we can protect that and maintain our important mission, which is running 24/7, 365 days a year to make sure that we're collecting and treating all that wastewater from those 2.6 million people. And uh, I might add that 2.6 million people, we are the sixth largest uh, wastewater agency in the country by, uh, based on population served. So um, many of our facilities being in, in coastal region that we are in Orange County is, are located near bodies of water. We have the Santa Ana River, uh, which empties to the Pacific Ocean right here adjacent to our plant number two in Huntington Beach. Uh, our plant number one in Fountain Valley is not as susceptible to uh, sea level rise or climate change, but it's located four miles inland in, in Fountain Valley. That's where I'm located today and where my, my office is that I'm sitting at right now. You can see these pump stations that are located near Newport Harbor, again, right near the uh, uh, Newport Bay and, and, and uh, definitely subject to tidal uh, influences there as well. Now the project drivers that got us to uh, uh, really explore this issue and, and make a plan uh, is uh, driven by the uh, state legislators, state legislature. So state agencies need to plan for climate change per uh, an executive order and by AB 2800. Um, wastewater agencies are also being required in their uh, ocean discharge permits or their NPDES permits to have a climate adaptation plan. And so those are the three drivers. We have an executive order, an assembly bill and um, uh, the requirements that are being put on agencies uh, through their NPDES permits. So, um, and furthermore, uh, if you look at coastal wastewater treatment facilities uh, in California who are applying for coastal commission permits, uh, some of them are being um, uh, directed to look at uh, options such as managed retreat, which is locate your facilities outside of the coastal zone that would be subject to uh, inundation due to sea level rise. So um, this is a, a uh, rapidly developing uh, uh, thing in California and, and agencies such as ours uh, are being uh, directed to make sure that we have plans to, to deal with it. So, um, as we began our effort, we decided to use available projections for sea level rise rather than try to go out and develop our own projections for, for what's going to happen in the future. And there's a lot of really good information out there 
a lot of science that's already been developed. Uh, the 2018 Fourth California report really helped us uh, with that science and provided us very, very valuable information. We also consulted with other large agencies. For example, we talked in New York City about the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy and, and what they did to make sure that they were prepared in the future for these types of events. Um, and once we were up to speed on the science, the available science, these are some of the different reports that you can see here uh, that are available to us and, and consulted with other agencies. Uh, we began to scope out uh, how we were going to do our uh, resiliency study. Um, so the way that we, we, we structured our study is first we projected what those future conditions are going to look like. What, what's the envelope of, of conditions that we have to operate in in the future? Uh, we then wanted to look at all of our facilities and identify how those individual facilities would specifically be impacted under different scenarios. Um, and then look at what are the best adaptation options for each of those different scenarios and those different facilities. Um, and in developing these protective measures, we looked at, you know, well, how much protection is, is enough? How much is too much? Uh, where is the sort of knee of the curve as far as investing in resiliency? Where do we get the most uh, benefit for the dollars that we're going to spend? Um, the study that we did wound up taking 10 months and it cost us about $700,000 uh, to do the study. So it was a very significant effort. But again, we're looking at protecting uh, the system for 2.6 million people and $11 billion uh, in infrastructure. So um, looking at the planning horizons, when we talk about uh, sea level rise, climate change and things, we're talking about a long time frame. But really those time frames are um, not uh, unrealistic when you're looking at a wastewater system like ours. And what I mean is that this type of planning is really an exercise in long-term thinking. If you're re rehabilitating existing uh, wastewater treatment facilities that, that are in operation everywhere in the US today, you're thinking about a 30 year timeline. That's, that's not uh, unusual. Thir planning 30 years ahead is, 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 is very, very common. Um, if you're building new facilities, well, you're planning for 50 years. You're looking at what is what are my demands going to be? What's my system going to look like in 50 years? And, and that's not um, uh, out of the realm of, of what we're seeing in projections for significant changes in, in, in sea level rise and so and in climate change. Um, so that's kind of how we're looking. A 50 year change puts us out to 2070. Um, an 80 year horizon, you know, that that is uh, out to 2100. And so. Uh, we're very, very um, forward looking in our system. We have to be because we're designing facilities. The two 100 acre sites that we looked at in the map where I showed you where our plants are located, that land was set aside back in the late 1940s and early 1950s when uh, the population of Orange County was less than 500,000 people. They visualized what that need would be uh, today in 2020 and it's, it's served us well. So that's, we wanna do the same thing for generations to come here. Uh, in, in our region. Um, the good news is there is time to adapt. There is time to uh, course correct through su successive update cycles. So the resiliency plan that we put together today in 2020 won't be the ultimate answer uh, in 2070. There will be time to do other iterations as we learn and see what actual conditions are. So we don't have to solve all of those challenges right now in the first five years. We're going to really adapt our approach and implement based on um, our, our rehab and rehabilitation plans as well. So we have projects that we know we need to implement uh, in Orange County to keep our system up and running. When we get to a major rehabilitation, we can take a look at it, take a look at the climate change implications, the resiliency implications, and build that into the project. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into that. Um, and we, again, we will be updating this plan several times uh, over the course of the next 50 years, we'll be doing several different uh, master plans uh, for our wastewater facilities and we'll make course corrections uh, as we learn more from the actual climate conditions that we're experiencing. So in our case, we did have to address multiple impacts uh, and all those impacts uh, can influence each, each other. For example, um, we have to plan for storms and rainfall. Well, when you add sea level rise to the equation, the impact of heavy rainfall and sea level rise together is additive. So we can't just look at one thing at a time. We had to look at um, sea level rise, heat and fire, uh, tsunami, also security for our site, right? We have site security things. If you're looking at, at flood walls and things, you wanna make sure that you're also addressing uh, the need to secure your site. Uh, these are critical facilities that do need to be secured. 
Um, all of those impacts need to be looked at together. So I think that, you know, for an agency like ours, one of the lessons was we could use this opportunity to address all of our ch challenges and try to find synergy where uh, we can address multiple um, uh, risks and multiple threats uh, at the same time uh, in our planning. And so I want to briefly talk about each of these threats and, and how we uh, address them. And again, on this, we, we see sea level rise, tsunami, fires, extreme heat events, and again, doing things so that we are minimizing our carbon footprint uh, as well in our operation. So first I'll talk about uh, wildfire and extreme heat. And as we all have experienced, California is seeing hotter summers uh, with more intense heat waves. We've also experienced devastating fires and, and more so in, in recent years. Um, and these have had tremendous impact on uh, utilities at like such, such as wastewater agencies in some parts of the state. Uh, we've seen higher temperatures uh, in inland Orange County in recent years. The good news with this is most of our infrastructure is in urbanized areas with minimal wildfire risk, but higher temperatures uh, can cause overheating of equipment and affect uh, performance of our facilities. So we're looking at that. Power disruptions are also anticipated as we have uh, you know, preemptive power outages to avoid the potential for fire starting. So we had to look at that as well. But generally, um, if you look at our service area in the map here, um, we are we are generally our facilities are generally outside of the extreme wildfire risk area because we're in heavily uh, urbanized area as far as uh, our treatment facilities goes. Flooding though is nothing new in Orange County. Uh, throughout history, we have the 1938 flood. We have an aerial view here. This is the flood that led to the construction of Prado Dam in Corona. You can see the blowouts in the Santa Ana River levees here in, in Orange County uh, in the area of uh, where our current plant number two is located. Um, uh, looking out towards the Pacific Ocean, uh, plant, our plant is located in this facility. You can see it was, it was definitely, I'm sorry, on this side, you can see that it was definitely uh, underwater at the time. This is a king tide in 2012 in, in uh, Huntington Beach. And this is a flood uh, associated with the 1983 El Nino event. So um, with sea level rise and more extreme storms, higher storm intensity associated with climate change, we are going to see uh, increased uh, flooding um, uh, impacts uh, on our facilities. Now, um, the other thing is high flow events uh, become a, a concern and, and that happens with increased rainfall. So what this chart shows um, is that um, in the orange is the average daily flow into the sanitation district's treatment plants. And you can see that that has kind of dropped here with water conservation. So right now we're down around 185 uh, million gallons a day of dry weather flow. If we go back to 2004, 2005, um, and in the late 1990s, we were close to around 250 million gallons a day. So because of water conservation, our flows dropped around 50 million gallons a day. Uh, which, which is, a, is a good thing. It shows that we're being more efficient in our use of water. The bars here, the blue bars show us what our peak instantaneous flow rates have been during high wet weather events. Again, because of inflow and infiltration during an extreme storm, our flow rate can more than double for short periods of time uh, due to the inflow and infiltration of, of rainwater uh, during a peak wet weather event. Um, you can see that while our base flow has dropped, the largest instantaneous flow that we've ever seen in the history of the agency was in 2017, 563 million gallons a day. That's with decreasing flows overall, we saw the highest flow rate. And that's because of the intensity of the rainfall that we saw in that wet weather event, January, uh, late January of 2017. So that's an example of increased storm intensity and how we have to plan for that, uh, that to increase. And, and this, period here takes in some very significant El Ninos. We have the El Nino of 1983. We have the El Ninos of the early 1990s and then the 2004-2005 uh, El Nino as well. And again, I think we can expect to continue to see uh, increased um, impacts uh, from rainfall on our influent flows. Uh, flooding risk. Uh, when we look at the FEMA uh, 2019 100 year floodplain map, uh, we, we, it looks like our facilities are, are kind of okay, uh, most of them. Uh, this is plant number two. This is our Slater pump station, barely gets in there. Some of our other pump stations get very close to, to being uh, inundated or impacted, but, but not too bad on the 100-year uh, FEMA uh, 
flood uh, facilities. We, we, we flood map projection. We, we seem like we're doing we're doing pretty well. Now, when we take into account uh, sea level rise, our flood risk is expected to increase. And so we can see that since 1926 in, in um, our, the tide gauge here in Los Angeles, we've seen about three inches of sea level rise since 1926, uh, between 1926 and 2018. And we're looking at projections for the future that show an increased impact. So, um, and, and there's an envelope of, of potential increases um, from, um, uh, you know, controlling emissions through uh, emissions uh, continuing to rise. So when we look at those scenarios in blue, this is this is the envelope with emissions continuing to rise throughout the 21st century. And you can see some pretty significant increases in sea level rise up to nine feet. Uh, the more optimistic one is about one foot. Um, in the orange, we show, hey, what if we control emissions around the year 2040 and start to decline? The envelope drops. Uh, the sea level rise impact isn't quite so much from about five and a half feet to again, about one foot. Um, and so um, we had to select a range that was we thought was realistic that would account for sea level rise, but not be so extreme that, that it, it, it creates a, you know, extreme costs that, that may never come true. Again, I mentioned between now and 2070, we're going to have time to make adjustments. We'll go through several different master planning exercises. So, um, but we selected 1.54 feet for ex our existing infrastructure, that level of increase by year 2050 and 3.71 uh, for new facilities. Again, an existing facility, we're gonna retrofit it now in 2020. It's got about 30 more years of life in it. We think we'll be at about 1.5 feet. If we're building a new facility today, it's gonna last 50 more years. We better plan for that 2070 uh, sea level rise that could be uh, 3.71 feet. We think that's a prudent uh, and, and cost-effective way to do it. Uh, it may seem precautionary, but again, this provides us with a margin of safety and, and we will have time to revisit it as we begin to move through uh, the timeline between now and 2070. Um, when we add uh, sea level rise and flooding together on top of the floodplain, um, they, our consultant used the 100 year fl FEMA flood uh, in 2019 plus 3.7 feet of sea level rise to take us out to 2070. Um, and we showed that that would impact these green dots seven of our pump stations and our plant number two in Huntington Beach would be in the inundation area during a, uh, this is this is during a peak rainfall in 2070 with uh, that uh, 3.71 feet of sea level rise. And this is a significant change compared to that uh, uh, 2019 map that I showed you uh, a, a little bit earlier. Here's a close up of an area near Newport Harbor. This is Lido Island, the Lido Peninsula area. You can see a lot of stuff is inundated here. One of our pimps, pump stations is the 15th Street pump station. It is inundated. Our Lido pump station and Rocky Point pump station comes pretty close, but it looks like it stays dry. So those are those are facilities that we're going to have to come up with an adaptation for. Uh, and I will be showing you a little more detail on that uh, as I go through the slides here. Now, we're talking about being in the coastal zone. If we just plan for sea level rise and rainfall, we can't ignore tsunami. So uh, we want to, if we take actions that protect from floods, maybe we can also take into account tsunami. So we had some excellent uh, reference material available from the American Society of Civil Engineers. They have a tsunami map uh, and that pro projected that we would have um, about the same tsunami run-up zone impact as we do from flooding in 2070 with sea level rise. They were remarkably similar. Uh, again, affecting a lot of the same pump stations and, and our treatment plant number two in Huntington Beach. Um, so, you know, that's something that we thought, hey, we let's let's deal with tsunami uh, as well as as flooding because it seems to have similar impacts. Um, so we've looked at all the available science at this point. We've looked at the, the, the tsunami run up. We've looked at the, the, the sea level rise projections and the rainfall things. Um, so we had to look at four different criteria, the projected impacts. What are we going to do? Are we going to retreat, move our facilities out of the coastal zone? Are we going to raise facilities up, build them higher with bigger foundations and, and, and raise them up? Uh, or are we going to try to build levees or try to protect them in place and, and try to hold the water back from our facilities so that they don't get inundated? Uh, the first thing we looked at was um, equipment level adaptation. So that would be facility by facility, treatment, 
equipment by treatment equipment, can you individually protect or individually raise those things up? Is that more cost effective or should you look at facility wide uh, adaptation? Um, we looked at that with four different criteria, the affordability, operability, ease of deployment, and then the reliability and effectiveness uh, of those um, adaptations. Um, when we did that, we looked at the facility level using those that four cri criteria, and we came up with um, an approach that is really the facility level um, protection adaptation. And that's what we're focusing on is protecting the entire facility, which at this point, we're talking about plant number two in Huntington Beach, 100 acre site protecting the entire thing um, from inundation rather than individual pieces of equipment. Now, some of these adaptations are surprisingly low tech and, and simple. And so I'll show you the example of a pump station facility. This is an example of a wastewater pump station. Um, you'll have a control room and electrical room located above grade with a below ground dry well and wet well. And the pumps are located in a dry well below grade. Um, and you can see you can see how that uh, is set up. An example, um, if we superimpose on this uh, pump station, the 100 year FEMA flood with 3.7 feet of sea level rise, you can see that's kind of our governing worst case here. We have a 500 uh, year FEMA flood uh, without uh, sea level rise in 2019. FEMA has, has recommended that we start to look at 500 year flood levels for, for infrastructure. And then we have our 100 year uh, flood with the 2050 sea level rise. And then we have our 100 year flood without sea level rise. So that's sort of an em envelope of different uh, uh, potential uh, um, uh, scenarios. Some of the floodways that can, things that can happen to this pump station. Again, these are, these are short term impacts. So it happens during the flood or during the high tide. Uh, and um, it, can, it can inundate the, the dry well through the hatches. It can come in through the doors and, and get into the control room and, and, and wet down the electrical equipment and take out this pump station. If you lose a pump station in a low lying area, you've just lost sewer service. So this is a critical facility that needs to be maintained. So now we can take a closer look at some of the things that we can do. We put in a barrier, simple barrier to protect the door so that flood can't get in. Again, we're only looking at a couple feet of, of, of water here and a barrier on the other side, a uh, barrier interior in case water got in to prevent water from, from coming down the stairway and getting in there. Same thing in the control room. And this is what some of this looks like for that one pump station I showed you is called the Lido pump station in, in the Balboa, uh, Balboa area, uh, Lido uh, Peninsula area. Um, we came up with uh, dry well hatches, right? Putting hatches on these that are waterproof like this, just you know, tighten those up in, in the place of these manholes that could be flooded. Uh, putting in a barrier, some stop logs in front of the doors uh, and seal, seal the doors to prevent water from coming in. Pretty modest improvements that really can take us through the year 2070, 2050 uh, and protect these facilities. So not, not too bad. Um, when we look at the um, value of that facility, so, so I looked at that pump station, it's about a $10 million pump station, pretty significant piece of infrastructure, but these are modest measures that are probably, you know, $100,000 type, type fixes to protect a $10 million facility. Very reasonable. Now, when we look at a 100 acre, uh, $3 billion wastewater treatment plant that treats about 140 million gallons of wastewater, um, we are looking at how to protect the entire facility. So um, we plan to protect it uh, using um, uh, some, some different uh, techniques that again are, are, are fairly uh, modest, I think, compared to the $3.2 billion replacement value of the facility. We do need to build a perimeter wall in this, in this area to protect the place, to, to secure it, right? Uh, uh, to prevent uh, intruders from coming in. So if we look at the need for security and we build it to be a flood barrier, uh, we solve multiple risks. We can protect it from storms. We can protect it from sea level rise. We can protect it from tsunami and provide the security. So here's kind of a, a look at what that looks like. Um, on, on this outside uh, boundary of the plant, we wanna raise the top of the wall to about 21 to 22 feet. And this is what that looks like. Um, and um, this, uh, this would be a, a multi-million dollar uh, project but again, it's predicting a $3 billion facility. And, and we're looking at the, the uh, water rise here of being you know, 10 to 13 feet above the street level uh, in the future. 
um, uh, during a 100-year uh, flood in the year 2070 with 3.7 feet of uh, sea level rise. So if I wanted to summarize our entire area and look at all of these threats um, and how we will adapt to them, heat uh, is primarily an inland issue with us. You know, during the coast, near the coast, it's not as big a deal. Primarily during the summertime, uh, and and that heat is something that uh, that we need to make sure that we have sufficient air conditioning and, and cooling for for our pump stations that are that are located inland, and it's not a big risk factor. Uh, we want to focus on storms, sea level rise, tsunamis at the coast. Um, and again, one uh, solution, integrated solution, can really um, ameliorate multiple risks uh, and increase resiliency for these important facilities. Um, we've also done a seismic analysis as well. So at the time that we're putting these improvements in, we're also going to be addressing seismic risk. Uh, the Newport Inglewood Fault could impact us here. Obviously, the San Andreas, so uh, uh, seismic uh, risk is being evaluated and implemented uh, into these solutions as well. Uh, and when you look at these little icons, so we've got heat, um, flooding, tsunami, we have earthquakes, sea level rise, uh, you know, we're really, really in an area that we have to think about uh, resiliency as, as being important uh, as we plan forward. Now, the, the uh, study that we did uh, came up with recommended imp imp implementation, and uh, they're actually fairly modest. They're pretty reasonable. The total cost here is about $30 million. Uh, one of our pump stations needs about a half million dollar uh, improvement of those stop logs and things to prevent it from flooding. Um, that, that's the case at two of them. One of them only needs about $100,000 worth of uh, protection. Another one, $400,000. And then the plant, the large... 100 acre plant site and all of that exterior wall that we need and some of the other interior improvements would be about $28 million. And that would take us out to 2070. Uh, and while that sounds like a lot of money, we're talking about um, you know $3.2 billion of infrastructure that's being protected. I think that's a, a very good uh, investment uh, in, in protecting that infrastructure. Now, um, going forward, uh, as we operate, um, Sustainable practices also help us with resiliency. Um, we are an agency focused on resource recovery, efficiency and energy diversification, uh, water recycling. Um, our project I mentioned with the Orange County Water District uh, to produce 100 million gallons a day of uh, recycled water, uh, potable quality water through reverse osmosis and, and ultraviolet light disinfection. Um, that water uh, takes about half as much energy to produce as it would take to import that water uh, from Northern California through the state water project. So that produces less greenhouse gas. That is a, a resiliency strategy in and of itself. Uh, renewable energy, um, again, I mentioned that we are using renewable energy, uh, uh, green energy uh, to power our plants for two thirds of our power use. Uh, we are going to build a new headquarters facility. We're going to integrate a solar power into that facility. Uh, we are working on uh, reducing the emissions of our fleet of uh, vehicles um, and uh, trying to be more efficient. We have just implemented a, a battery system. We have a, a five megawatt a battery system. It's the largest, at least it was when it was installed and commissioned a year ago, the largest behind the meter uh, battery storage system uh, in North America. And, and that can take our treatment plant off the grid during peak power demand periods uh, when uh, renewables start to go offline in the evening. Um, and we're very proud of that facility as well. So. A lot of what we're doing um, in, in our uh, renewable portfolio and really reflects the state's goals to reduce um, greenhouse gases by 40% uh, below 1990 uh, levels. So uh, again, that, that's you know, forward thinking again, trying to reduce our impact to try to help uh, reduce uh, the potential uh, for this problem in the future. So with that, um, if you're interested in learning more about OC SAN, uh, please follow us on social media or go to our website. Uh, we do have um, online tours of our facilities that you can sign up for, uh, and we are willing to uh, provide you with uh, more information. Um, that concludes my presentation, and, and I'm willing to uh, entertain questions. Thank you very much, James. Uh, this is uh, definitely very interesting presentation. A lot of great work uh, going on in, uh, in your district. Uh, 
I, I see a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to start with my own question. Uh, um, you mentioned four criteria and, and, and can you elaborate a little bit more about the four criteria you had? Is this um, the affordability part? Is that going to be affordability for the customers in the service area or um, that would be, um, or is that a different kind of affordability you are talking about? Right. So I think affordability does ultimately translate to the affordability of the customers and, and the way that the Orange County Sanitation District um, pays for our service is we have a annual service fee. So for residential properties, each uh, residential property on their property tax bill, there's a little line that says Orange County Sanitation District uh, for a single family residence. Uh, that's about three hundred and forty dollars a year. Uh, that's the that's the the, the the fee that we charge. Uh, we think that's a pretty modest fee for the service that we provide. You know, annual fee. Uh, but it, you know, anything that you 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 add on to the cost of housing in California can be an affordability issue. So, uh, and same thing with our rates on commercial businesses. Uh, we want to be affordable. We can't just go out and and um, not consider cost. Uh, there there is an affordability issue, obviously, with 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 water and wastewater, and and we're very cognizant of that. So. We speak about affordability. We're talking ultimately about the customers and the ratepayers. Perfect. And I see a, a question by uh, Kersh Ravi, our colleague at UCRSPP. I'm going to allow him to, to ask his question live. Uh, but to add to his question, I want to also um, ask, which is a little bit related to this, what are sort of your collaboration? You, you, you mentioned multiple sort of threats and, and you want to address that. But how about multiple agencies within the uh, Orange County. And yeah. let me, let, let me, let me, uh, let uh, Kurt also ask question because he, he's also is related to this. Uh, Kurt, I'm going to unmute you now. Um, all right. Great, thanks, Manny. And Jim, thanks, uh, really wonderful talk. Uh, in, enjoyed listening to you and learning from you on this. Um, the one, I guess, two questions I had now that Manny's opened up my mute button. <laughs> um, is do you have partnerships upstream? I mean, it seems like your main input obviously is the inflows coming into your plant. And therefore you would think that there'd be maybe some coordination or partnerships that you have with agencies or upstream uh, stakeholders upstream and that would affect maybe the quantity and the quality of water that you're getting. And kind of following up on that, are you at all worried about um, given the kind of the decrease in your base flow, um, you know, the, the new efficiency requirements come 2025 of, 50 gallons per capita per day indoor? Um, so we do have, uh, the first question, we do have um, um, agreements and partnerships with agencies upstream. So um, one of them that is um, uh, you know, longstanding and, 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 and fairly well known is our partnership with the Santa Ana River Watershed Project Authority, SAPA. And so SAPA um, discharges about uh, 20, or I, up to up to 17 million gallons a day, and I think it's it's, it's lower than that right now. It might be about 12 million gallons a day of um, uh, salty wastewater from the upper basin uh, through the San Ana River interceptor uh, to our plant number two in Huntington Beach, where it's treated through primary and secondary treatment and and discharged to the ocean. And that's been going on uh, since the early 1970s. And the idea is to take that uh, salty wastewater and it, it's brined from groundwater to salters and, 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 and re removing, um, salt from the groundwater basin, basically, uh, and, and, and exporting that through us, um, out to the ocean. Um, and that effort has, has gained steam and, and the, the flow has increased over the years. And it's extremely important, uh, not only to the, um, Inland Empire, but to Orange County to, to reduce the salts, uh, in, in the, in the San Ana River flow and, and in the, uh, the groundwater basin. Um, that partnership has been going on for a long time. Uh, and we worked uh, cooperatively with SAPA, the Corps of Engineers, uh, Riverside County Flood Control, Orange County Flood Control, and others uh, to relocate that line, that brine line, out of the area of the Santa Ana River that's subject to um, erosion, uh, particularly with higher flows that will be released from Prado Dam as it's being um, raised up. We had a big project to to relocate that important piece of infrastructure, that inland brine line, and get it out of the floodplain so that it uh, that it won't uh, be subject to erosion during high flow. So, that's that's one example. Um, and what was your other question? You had two questions there. You had one about partnerships and one about. I 
can ask yeah, the other Yeah, okay, now, now oh, I whoa. got it. Yeah, so I couldn't unmute. Yeah, the phase flow and 50-50 and, and gallons per capita. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I you know, I showed the trend of our flow rates over time and how it's decreased. And, and a lot of that is because of uh, water use efficiency improvements and that uh, it's expected to decrease uh, down to around 50 gallons per capita a day. Uh, and would that have a bad impact on us? Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see that as being bad. Um, I think water conservation is good. You know, we may see an increase in our influent suspended solids. We have seen an increase in that. Uh, it, it increased from around 250 uh, parts per million of TSS and BOD up to around 350. Uh, that means each uh, gallon of water that comes in uh, takes more uh, treatment and generates more solids. Uh, so you have the same amount of pollutants or actually more coming in in a smaller package. And so we had to adjust our operation. Uh, and we did that. We were able to do that successfully. Um, other agencies report problems with solids deposition and odors and things like that in the collection system. We've seen some of that. We've made adjustments and, and we've been able to overcome it. Um, if it drops down quite a bit further to that 50, we may see some need to make further adjustments. Um, uh, but um, we don't, we haven't projected that that's, uh, you know, catastrophic or anything, but it could, it could be, it could be a problem with more frequent cleaning, uh, more corrosion and uh, more odors uh, could be a problem. And then, you know, we're trying to maximize the amount of water that re we're recycling. Um, but our goal is to recycle all the water that we catch, that we, that we collect. And, and, and with the expansion of the groundwater replenishment system, uh, we'll be able to do that uh, here uh, beginning in 2023. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, there is like a, there's a question by IDNs and then there's a question by Ario. I will ask the first question and then Ario can follow on, on his question. Is there any sort of uh, uh, difficulties uh, or, or some, uh, political difficulties on getting funding uh, to support the efforts that you are making, given um, given the some of the environment and around uh, climate change and how we uh, you know talk about it, and some people are not uh, uh, they don't believe or or are climate deniers. Uh, Right, um, right, and there, yeah, there, there, there definitely is not, you know, a complete consensus about about that with everyone, and 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 whether uh, whether you uh, believe that climate change is is going to really happen, or um, or that it's man-made, or whatever your whatever your opinion is about it, uh, these state these mandates that I, I showed in one of the slides are there. So um, we're required by executive order, by uh, an assembly bill, and by our ocean discharge permit to address it and have uh, the resiliency plan in place. So whether, whether we, you know, believe it or not, it's required. And so, um, and again, the adaptations that we're making address multiple problems. They address tsunami, you know, flooding and sea level rise and, and security at the same time. So, um, and, and they're modest in, in, re in, in respect to the overall size of the investment in infrastructure. So, um, we really haven't had a whole lot of problem with that. And, and again, you know, it's it's mandatory. Um, thank you. Are you, can, you can go ahead and ask your question. Um... You can read it, Mehdi. Do you want me to read it? Okay. So, yeah. uh, uh, all right. Uh, so, how many other agencies do do you think, or, or do you have any statistics on that? Uh, on how many other agencies in California or in Southern California are going to face similar problems? Uh, um, right. I think that you know, as, as far as I know, um, I don't know of anyone else who's who's prepared a, a resiliency plan like this yet. Um, and, and I think one of the triggers for, for agencies is that uh, it, it's when they, uh, their per discharge permit is up um, or if they're doing a major project and they need to get approval by the Coastal Commission. So um, I would expect that most agencies as their permit recycle comes up on a permit renewal cycle comes up every five years are going to have to prepare a plan like this. Um, and that, um, you, know, uh, you know, facilities that are located near the coast um, are going to have to address these issues. 
uh, because of the um, changed, you know, flooding footprints uh, with with sea level rise taken into account. Um, I don't know exactly who that will impact, but I can imagine most of the coastal places will have to deal with it. Um, and I, I don't think there's, you know, any way around it. I think they're going to have to prepare a, a plan similar to what we're talking about here. Perfect. And 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 then one last question or or, uh, or comment I have. Is that you? You went through this whole process this past few past few years. Uh, what what would be your take home message for other agencies starting to you know prepare a plan or, or they're just starting out uh, to do this? I you know a few messages. One one would be um, you don't have to uh, develop the science yourself. I think there's some great resources out there between the American Society of Civil Engineers and the, the other uh, resources that are. Uh, projections for, for sea level rise and flooding footprints and things like that. There's a lot of good information out there. Um, and, and again, I think um, taking the long approach, understanding that you're going to be able to make adap adaptions between now and 2070 um, and implementing it as you go through your facilities and, and do, your, do your rehabilitation, just try to account for it uh, and see how much the impact is going to be. And I think um, one of the lessons is it doesn't have to be um, ridiculously expensive. I think there are some modest things that we've shown that, that you can do, uh, at least in our case, uh, to get a, a, a lot of uh, resiliency built in. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Jim. It seems there is another uh, question. Uh, when Okay, uh, Kurt, I, I'm I'm muting you so you can answer your question. It seems a little bit long. Um, I'm I'm yeah. <laughs> I want this social discussion. engagement. So Jim, thanks a lot. You're going to be part of my social interaction today. Um, so I've heard a lot of discussion. I think maybe San Diego County is doing this. Is is moving towards direct potable reuse. Um, in your long range planning, I see a lot of investments in in continuing the IPR projects. If if I can characterize it that way. Do you think about uh, direct potable reuse and how that would change your investments for long-term planning? Yes, I, I think uh, uh, you know uh, direct potable reuse is is um, is probably coming to California. Uh, I hear, we hear more about that, um, and regulations being you know uh, worked out at, in order to make that come true. In Orange County, we're very very fortunate in the Orange County Water District Basin where we're located, right, the central and northern Orange County. We have this great groundwater basin to store water in. Um, and, and so um, well, I think we can recycle all the water we have that's recyclable and, and we can put it in the basin and it's a great storage facility. Um, and we have, you know, our producers, our cities use wells to access that water. So the way that we're set up, I don't think that, that uh, direct potable reuse is really necessary. And I think that that between the um, the seawater intrusion barrier, that's where the Orange County Water District takes the the purified water, pumps it into the groundwater basin near the coastline to push the seawater out, keep it from infiltrating in and, and and taking out wells with salinity. Between that demand and the capacity of the groundwater basin to to hold uh, the the purified water, I think. Uh, that's the that's the best most effective way for us to to manage it here in Orange County. Other areas like San Diego, uh, where they don't have a, a good groundwater basin like we do, um, have different challenges. And I think that that DPR um, is is more uh, likely in those areas, or or adding it to their surface, augmenting their surface water supplies, things like that. But in Orange County, we're you know we're we're good in, in our area. We're lucky to have this nice big groundwater basin. Um, perfect. Thank you very much, James. And and um, we have some students in the audience, and they are interested to uh, you know what they can do uh, to get involved in this field and and and, and prepare if they want to enter to the field. Um, well, I um, you know encourage you to uh, uh, follow uh, what's going on here at Orange County Sanitation District. We do have an internship program. Uh, it's not as active right now, unfortunately, with the pandemic and 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 you know working remotely. Uh, but one day the pandemic will pass, and, and we will once again be uh, hiring interns. 
Uh, if you follow us on, on social media, uh, you can sign up and be notified of when we have um, uh, positions opened up. Uh, you can come on tours of our facility. We encourage you, uh, virtual tours or, or in-person tours. If you go to ocsan.gov, our, our website, you can find out how to sign up for tours to learn more about it. Um, and um, those would be the primary ways that, that, that I think you can engage here. Um, again, right now, it's, it's being done differently uh, because of the pandemic, but hopefully we turn the corner on that fairly soon and, and we're back to, uh, to hiring interns. We have interns in different areas. We have interns in, um, within our uh, laboratory and environmental compliance and monitoring area. We have them in our engineering area where we do capital projects, design and construction. And we have them uh, in, in our operation where we look at uh, process optimization and, and those things. So great opportunities. And I would encourage you to look into that if, if you're uh, interested. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, this has been very informative. Uh, I learned a lot and, and, and uh, I'm sure I just enjoyed it. Uh, the, the video will be up uh, uh, in a few minutes and I can share the link with, uh, with, with you if you want to share it with your contacts and everyone and it will be in our website uh, as well uh, for future. Uh, we do have uh, three more seminars in the winter quarter. Uh, those are coming up pretty soon. Uh, uh, I will share the information uh, probably early January about the speakers. Uh, uh, thank you again very much, everyone, for participating, uh, especially Jim. Thank you for your great presentation. Thank, thank you all for having me, and, and thank you for giving me your time and your attention and your interest. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, any questions or follow-up that you might have uh, with our agency. Thank you very much.